So you've just clicked on a really long video. So if you're interested in learning about racial bias in dog and dog behavior, then you may want to check out a shorter version of this video, which looks like this. It's a 20 minute video. It's in the description box below. But if you do have two hours to contribute to a deep dive investigation into this, what you will be watching right now is all of the interviews I had with three professional dog trainers of color, and they investigate and they discuss whether or not a dog can be racist. And we also pose some solutions you can do to help your dog's reactivity if you think that your dog has a racial bias. My name is Jenna and on this channel we break down scientific research in order to inform and educate us on training dogs, but today you're just going to hear the interviews. Now some a couple things I do want to mention before you get into the interviews is that my interview with Gio Cage, she was in the middle of a storm when she did this with us, so her service is a little bit shaky and every once in a while you'll notice her camera gets a little rocky. I promise if you just wait two seconds it'll come right back and everything will be okay. Additionally, unfortunately, my interview with Curtis Kelly ended, uh, cut off at the very end of the video. You really only miss about three minutes of the conclusion, um, but it's it's all there effectively, and I hope you enjoy. Hello. Um, go ahead and introduce yourself and um, tell us where you're from and all that good stuff. All right, um, I am Gio, Giovanni Alcade. I am a CPDTKA certified dog trainer. I'm also Fear Free certified and I am half of Smart Bitch Modern Dog Training. Uh, thank you for, for uh, entertaining our cheeky name. Um, we are a R plus um, trainers doing, doing the good deed. Um, Taylor, go ahead and take it away. Hi guys, my name is Taylor Barconi. I'm also a certified professional dog trainer, CPTKA. I'm also a Fear Free animal trainer. You and I have basically identical identities except for our <laughs> names. Um, and yeah, love dogs. So we are R plus, and that is me, and I'm the other half of Smart Bits. So here we go, 100%. Nice to meet you guys. Very excited to be here. I appreciate you guys sitting down, educating our viewers, um, and discussing a uh, pretty complex, but not that complex conversation. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's, it's an interesting one. Um, so one of the things that, from the title of the video, the viewers will know that one of the conversations I want to talk about is can a dog be a racist? Um, is it possible if, I'm, if I have a dog and they seem to be treating a black person differently than they're treating a white person and I see that as racism, is that actually what's happening? Um, before we answer whether or not a dog can be racist, um, I kind of want you guys to talk about that question in and of itself and um, break it down because there are some inherent flaws in that question. Yeah. And I'm wondering if you guys can speak to that. Yeah, and I'm actually, um, thank you for um, opening this discussion for us. So that question is very loaded. <laughs> there are so many things to that question. The first thing I want to admit as a um, of color trainer is a very uncomfortable question to be asked. And it's not usually asked in this way. It's not asked as if, People don't ask, are dogs racist? People typically ask it in a statement, like, oh, I think my dog doesn't like black people. They whisper it, you know, very uncomfortable to ask, or they don't ask us in, in general because they know that I am of color. So maybe they, they don't feel comfortable to ask me. But we are aware that people are probably thinking it. So this is a good discussion to have feelings aside. So we want to address this because, again, we want to make sure that we add our opinion to it, but also the science behind dogs their behavior and also their um, physiology. So let's go ahead and break down this question to the core because again, it's really loaded. The first thing I want you guys to understand is that race, so we said racist, so race is a human construct. Dogs do not understand um, the racial divide between ethnic groups. They don't understand that. They understand that they are dogs and we are some alien being that's not a dog. That's what they understand. So they don't really understand the difference between a black person, a white person, a Puerto Rican person, like she up there. So it's really important that we understand that. Secondly, understand that humans, us, we tend to anthropomorphize dogs all the time. This means that, or anthropomorphize means that we tend to apply human attributes or behavior to dogs. We do this all the time, and sometimes even as trainers, we may make the same mistake or we may joke about it. But here's where we go wrong with this. 
people often tell us, oh, I think my dog is feeling guilty because when I came home, my dog, I came home to destruction and my dog seemed to act guilty. The dog shrunk away from me, showing me my, his belly, ears, the back, seeming really guilty. People also say, oh, I think my dog is feeling spiteful because my dog peed on the floor right after I left. So he must have tried to do that to spite me. I'm here to say, we're both here to tell you guys that dogs are not capable of feeling guilt or acting guilty or spitefulness, nor are they able to feel con contempt or hate. Contempt or hate, this is really important. So going back to the original question, dogs literally cannot be racist in the same sense that humans are because they are not able to feel contempt. Contempt is a precursor to racism, okay? And here's why, let's, let's, go into, let's delve into it further. So the mature dog brain can be said to be equivalent to a human child, a two-year-old or two-and-a-half-year-old human child's brain, emotionally. They're pretty much the same thing, emotionally. According to um, Dr. Stanley Corrin from the Psychology Today, it's proven that um, dogs can have the same emotions against a two- or two-and-a-half-year-old child, but after two years old, human children tend to get other emotions too. So, for example, before I go into that, Understand that we as humans, we didn't always have the complex emotion that we have now. We didn't start off with pride, shame, or guilt. We you, Typically, we started off with excitement or arousal and then other fear. All that other stuff came in later. So pride, shame, guilt, these are very complex emotions. And humans, we didn't have that at first. So if a human and a dog's brain, a young human and a dog's brain are pretty much equivalent, the same thing applies to dogs. In actuality, pride, guilt, and then contempt doesn't come for um, human babies until maybe three, four years old, and then onward. So dogs' maturity, their brain maturity stops before then. So they are literally not capable of feeling contempt, nor guilt, or spite. So keep that in mind if you ask your trainer or anyone, is my dog racist? That's not possible. However, it is a much, it's much better to word this question to this way, into the two different ways. Is it possible for dogs to discriminate between different ethnic groups of people? And, and then, is it possible for a dog to develop fear towards individuals of one ethnic group? That's how I want you guys to think about this question. Is it possible for dogs to discriminate between a black person and a white person? And is it possible for them to develop fear towards one person, another person? Which is a better, really good way to word it. And it shows a basic understanding of how dogs think. That's the biggest thing about dog training and then the dog community. A lot of us don't really understand how dogs think, especially um, our average dog owner. So this is why I'm really glad you guys listen to us today. We're gonna break down how dogs, you know, how, how their structure, how their eyes work and things like that. And we're gonna offer what science tells us so far and also what we know from personal experience as black and of color trainers. We're also gonna do our best and try to hypothesize what we think of how dogs perceive us or their point of view. Okay. And the last thing I want to say in towards this question is that I really I want you guys to consider before we go into the other questions is how your behavior can affect your dog's behavior. If you have a racial bias and if you act on that racial but racial bias, how you respond to people will affect how your dog responds. So keeping that in mind, we're going to move forward as if you do not have a racial bias and word the um the questions that way. Okay. I hope to answer that question. <laughs> All right, so I wanted to bounce off of um, what, you know, what Taylor had just said about, you know, debunking racism and uh, digging further into how dogs, how their eyeballs work and how, um, you know, if you're looking at this from a scientific level, really having to understand that what, how dogs perceive us is vastly different than how we perceive things. So the very first thing that you should know is that dogs see quite literally very differently than we do um, in terms of color. Uh, we see an entire higher spectrum of color whereas dogs um where there is a myth that they are colorblind they are not in fact colorblind they do see um they are red green colorblind meaning that they have a really hard time seeing um green hues and red hues but they see the colors blue and yellow very well and knowing this knowing that they don't have a very broad spectrum um this means that okay the colors that are in between, you know, when you're looking at skin tones and shades, these are all earth tones, right? When we, when we talk about white people and black people and brown people, 
these are aren't very far away in a small area of the spectrum. So to say that dogs are, you know, discriminating against color in particular is kind of a reach because their eyes aren't technically engineered to be able to see these colors as vastly different. Now, if I were yellow and Taylor were blue, or if we were quite literally at the ends of the spectrum of black and white, then it would be a little bit more um, of an argument. But because we are so close in color, even you know, with Taylor's skin tone, my skin tone, and Jenna, your skin tone, it's really not that far apart. So again, you know, bringing back down to that, the racial biases, um, it doesn't, it's not also something that can be created in a dog's line of eyesight. Um, the other things to know, you know, how dogs communicate with people is that um, this, is, this is through a world of cues. This isn't anything that is, um, is, you know, they have to be taught things or they have to have the opportunity to learn things. So, you know, they, they really need, I'm losing my chain of thought. You're going to have to cut that right there. I'm so sorry. I'm losing my spot on my, um, no, on yeah, my I know outline. It's a lot. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, you're okay. I think, I think you were yeah. leading me to the depth of yeah, death perception. Sorry. So yeah, cut that. Start here. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So basically, um, you know, looking at cues, looking at things, dogs also, they do not primarily rely on just their eyesight. In fact, you know, they really perceive the world uh, through their sense of smell. That is honestly the most important um, aspect for a dog. Most dogs primarily rely on their sense of smell. So again, trying to equate the eyesight as the most important factor, that's really not it. You know, if let's say <clears throat> the assumptions that a dog is um, racist, so to speak, is solely on the basis that a dog is approaching a fence line. Well, the dog may be reacting far before they even see that person. Maybe it's because they hear them before they're coming, um, which is, you know, their ears are incredible. Maybe they smell them before they're coming. So the way they perceive the world is vastly different than how we perceive the world because their senses are heightened in areas in which ours are not. And this does really you know, create a different situation altogether. Um, and then in terms of their eyes and how they use their eyes, you know, if we're, if we're looking on a very scientific level, we're looking at rods and cones. These are the ways that eyes are created or, you know, created, um, you know, how we have evolved. Their eyes ha are not evolved in the sense that they perceive the color, but they are evolved in the sense that, you know, some dogs have, if, if they're set in a specific way, this is to, for hunting, purposes essentially this is to catch small prey skittering so they can see things more clearly uh sight hounds in particular um these dogs are literally genetically engineered to see things moving so this is not an important you know color is not an important factor this is something that's like not even evolutionary necessary for these animals so i think that's a really another really important thing to keep in mind when we're thinking about you know can dogs be racist is does this even actually serve them a purpose? Does racism or do seeing color, does that actually serve them a purpose? Um, this would honestly, this would make more sense if, if color in, pers you know, in perspective was being used for like other animals that had alarming colors, such as, you know, we see a black widow. And so we see that red, you know, that red on their back and we're instantly alerted to something like that. Well, black people don't walk around with a big, mark on them that says I'm dangerous. You know, there isn't any special indicator of specific people of ethnic groups that tells other animals that are not of the same species. You know, this is, you're looking at two different spectrums here. You have dogs versus humans. So dogs don't have a reason to look at our particular skin tone and say, that person's dangerous, man. Like, I don't know about that. Um, it would be based off of more factors. And I, I think that's probably a really good way to to think about it on more of a, um, you know, an anatomical level. I think mm -hmm. that's really what I was trying to get at there. Um, okay. All right. Next so question. you were mentioning that there's, you know, other factors that would go into play. Um, you know, what are some of the things, that, like if I have, if I'm an owner and I've just learned that no, my dog is being racist, but, but he could be discriminating potentially between two color tones, potentially, mm -hmm. right? Um, what, what do I do next? What am I thinking? What, how did it get to this point? What do I do to change it? 
Okay, so before we answer the question of how do we change it, I want to first kind of bounce off what Gio said about um, skin tone and all that stuff like that, about how um, dogs really, they can't really know, it's really, if they could notice, it'd be very hard for them to notice different skin tones. I also want to mention the complexity of humans, which makes the, makes the argument or makes the question, do they know a black person versus a white person, really hard to answer because humans are very complex. We are way more than our skin tone. And the, we, the biggest thing that makes us different is the fact that we wear clothes. Now, the argument about seeing between different skin tones would make more sense if we were nudists. You know, it, shout out to the nudists out there. We're not nudists, but mo most people are not nudists. If we were nudists, if we were all naked and we, um, our skin tone was very obvious for dogs to see, Perhaps they notice a white person more because white person a white person would be if they were um, if their skin tone was light maybe they can notice the brightness of their skin tone we are not sure but even if they could that's a real that's a reach and it's really hard to argue argue for that because again we do wear clothes but the clothes aren't the only thing that we do that makes us different we also walk differently we have accessories we have a lot of different things on top of what we do that really does kind of change. It, it kind of makes humans a very difficult species to decipher, okay? So again, we are very complex. We wear clothes, we wear hats, we wear shoes, we wear all kinds of things in our heads. We are different, um, different waist, with different um, height. So it's really hard to make that the, um, distinction between do dogs really understand the difference between certain ethnic groups, okay? So, like I just said, skin tone isn't the only thing that makes us human. Again, all the things we wear makes us human. All the things that we have on makes us human. But also, we also have to play, play into mind that dogs may also respond to the way that we're shaped, the, how, high, how tall we are, maybe the different shapes that we are, and also our scent. I am a, I am a short person, you as a short person. Maybe if a dog meets a very tall person, maybe they'd be, they'd be more wary if they were only around people of Gio and I's height. Also, we hear of dogs that are more afraid of men than women. And I think there's science out there that shows that men are naturally more intimidating because of how they walk or how they carry themselves. And dogs, as you guys are, um, are aware, if you aren't aware, I'm going to say this now, dogs respond, um, dogs can be really nervous about how we present ourselves. If we are very confrontational, very frontal, then you can expect dogs to be more nervous about us. So yes, it, is, it makes more sense to recognize that, yes, maybe dogs may be more afraid of men or women or vice versa and again men smell vastly different from women so we have to keep all this in mind are they discriminated between a black and white person well first have we figured out are they okay with what the person is wearing are they okay with the height are they okay with the scent are they okay with this it's kind of like humans are onions <laughs> we have lots of layers and the shrek on a shrek quote very lame but we have to actually go through these layers to make sure okay have we, have the dog knows this, the dog knows this, the dog knows this, okay? And to give you guys a good example of the different things that we do that may complicate things, we wear masks now, we wear hats. Some people have very large beards. I have an afro. Some people tend to have bald heads. People either walk slowly or jog or run very fast. Sometimes people are injured and maybe they have a limp. Maybe they use a cane, maybe they use a walker, maybe they use a wheelchair. There are so many different things to what makes us human. And it's really hard to pinpoint if the dog is looking at a skin tone, if we aren't sure if the dog is looking at something else before that, okay? And I hope that makes sense. So the idea is, can let's go through the, the list of things, which is virtually impossible, to see what the dog is reacting to or responding to before we say that it is skin tone. And the way that we change it, I'm going to actually hold off on that because I think talking about socialization first is really important to talk about changing. Because if we're saying that we have to change a behavior, it seems like there may be a behavior problem. Are you saying that your dog is reacting, lunging, barking, and growling? It looks like it's that people of color, but you aren't sure? Can we pinpoint it? Can we pinpoint? That's the question. But let's talk about socialization and exposure, and then let's talk about how we change it. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm gonna go ahead and take over on socialization. So. Um, for the viewers, um, the, the purpose of socialization, so, you know, this is kind of a big word. It, it is slung around in the dog training community, and sometimes it can be a little confusing. So, socialization is the process of exposing your dog to 
different things, essentially. And socialization can happen the wrong way and the right way. Now, what we want to happen is that it happens the right way. But more often than not, when people are asking themselves the questions, if they think that their dog is per se racist or having reactive moments, because many times when people ask, is my dog racist? It's because they're seeing a level of reactivity. Reactivity meaning that the dog is acting unfavorably, whether that be you know, excessive aggression. Um, but reactivity can also show itself as a very extreme form of submissive fear. Oh my God, the dog is freaking out, running away. And so the reason why we like to preface all of this stuff before we even bring up socialization is because, again, the way the dogs perceive the world is not just based off of one thing. When people ask about racism in particular, it's because that's what they see first. You know, they see that it's a black person that is, you know, coming and they're like, oh, okay, well, this has happened more than once, so it just must be black people. Um, but what was the instance in which this person had actually approached your animal? Was it because it was a UPS driver? And UPS drivers drive very large trucks and they wear a uniform, typically also wearing a hat. Now, the color of your UPS driver's skin was probably the last thing that was on your dog's mind. Um, was it someone who was doing lawn care who was pushing a lawn mower? You know, and, and there's, there's a multitude of things when it comes to socialization. So how you want to fix it, essentially, is I think there's two answers there. If you have a puppy, this is the easiest answer, is when you have a young dog, the best thing that you can do is expose your animal in the best way possible, in a positive way, give them you know, rewards to everything that they come across. And don't limit their exposure to different types of people, sizes of people, and types of energy. This is really what it boils down to. Um, there are plenty of you know, dogs that are a little finicky around children, but it has nothing to do with the fact that the color of that child, it may just be the energy level. And so it's really important that we expose them to, you know, tons of different things so that we aren't narrowed down into this funnel of, oh, it must be the color of that person. Um, moving forward with that improper socialization, what happens there? Let's say we skip socialization. We have an adult dog who's just straight up having a lot of fears or improper socialization can also happen when you tried socialization and you didn't realize that it wasn't working. For instance, uh, many people, a really good example of this is New Orleanians. New Orleanians, um, you know, we have Mardi Gras and we love our community. And a lot of people have a tendency to bring their dog along to parades. Well, when a puppy is really young, they may seem like they're doing okay, but in the future, you may have created a situation in which the dog was actually fearful that entire time. And so that would be a really good example of improper socialization. In socialization, what's happening when a, in a young dog's mind is that everything is, you know, they're very impressionable. They see things, they absorb it, and they make the decision whether or not this is something that they deem as either dangerous or an opportunity. It's important to know that dogs are amoral. They do not understand right from wrong. They just understand dangerous versus opportunity. And if you put dogs in a situation in which they deem something dangerous, then you have improperly socialize them. So creating situations in which um, the dogs are, 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 in a, are in an environment that they feel like they have control and then exposing them to, again, different types of people. And when I say types of people, I don't necessarily mean color. I actually am focusing more on the shape of these people. Tall men versus short men versus wide women or petite women or quick skittery children or you know slow old ladies with walkers. This is socialization. This is what it's going to make um, dogs' perception of people a little more bulletproof, so to speak. And if you do this, then you will see, and this, again, this is circling back to the young dogs who, who let's say, haven't been you know, improperly socialized. If you do this, then you won't really have to ask yourself the question, is my dog racist, or try to kind of pinpoint or go down that rabbit hole. Now, say you have a problem, and you well, honestly, my easiest answer to you would be to seek help with a certified professional dog trainer. You are going to be going through a process of counter conditioning and you need to pinpoint triggers. You probably need help pinpointing triggers. For you, for the, for the average dog owner, when you see a dog who is reacting and it looks like they're reacting particularly to a race, 
you probably need the help of a professional to see the bigger picture. You aren't necessarily trained to see these things, um, but ways to try and see them is again, every, everything that we have been listing up until this point. What do these people look like? What time of day is it? What do they smell like? What are they actually doing? What are they shaped like? Do they wear sunglasses? Are they bald? Do they have a beard? All of these things seem really kind of scary when you look at it that way, which is why I say your easiest answer is to seek out a certified professional. And if you are going to go through the process of counter conditioning and rehabilitating their reactions towards any types of triggers, you will need um, to know exactly what you're going, you know, you're going to do. And it is highly encouraged that you do fix these with rewards-based methods. You are not going to be able to essentially, you know, beat the scared out of the dog. Um, you can't fight fire with fire. So we love to say that if you want to rehabilitate something, identify, help, have someone help you actually identify the triggers that are present for this animal and then work slowly on fixing these types of things. Um, okay, so in terms of um, what a client at home can do if you are concerned if your dog has any types of prejudices, whether that be um, if you feel like that might be racially driven or if you're just not really sure, um, we would say uh, try some management tactics first. You know, a lot of people think that this is something that needs to be tackled uh, primarily, primarily via training. However, a lot of times when dogs have the opportunities to exercise, um, I guess, ill behaviors or behaviors that you are not fond of, they will get better at it. And that is regardless of whatever the circumstances may be. So if you find that your dog has a you know, it's, it's having um, adverse reactions towards the mailman or, or, you know, cars or people with strollers, whatever that may be, literally the circumstances don't matter. What you need to do first is manage those moments. So if it's within your home, if you know your dog has a problem with charging windows, you should be blocking their ability to get to the front, to get to those windows, whether that be installing baby gates or maybe um, providing some type of visual barrier that is not that easy to take down. For instance, um, curtains and blinds, they don't really cut it. And in fact, you're probably just gonna keep paying for curtains and blinds. Whereas you may find that a window cling, something that really does um, stop the view, that can also help tremendously. Um, other, other things that you can do, let's say you want to, I guess, I guess the term would be rehabilitate this on your own or try to mend their reactions is honestly, guys, the answer is food <laughs> for the most part. A lot of times, if you take a step back, if you provide an in incredible amount of distance, honestly, a lot of times people think by dragging their dog up to the thing that they are scared of, it's just going to make them tough it out. Well, Dogs don't learn that way, and it doesn't matter, again, it does not matter what that trigger is, you have to treat it um, in a sense that you are respecting that they have, a, you know, some type of fear, because typically this does stem from fear, and that you want to mend this, um, this relationship with, with whatever that may be. So pairing this with distance plus really tasty food. And I'm telling you, uh, pull out the stops, whether that is boiled chicken, if it's peanut butter, if that's what your dog likes. Um, it's really going to be up to you to determine what is motivating to your dog. And when I say motivating, I mean they should be willing to practically take your fingers off. Like it, they need to want it. If they don't want it enough, then one of two things may be happening. It's not good enough. If you're trying to train with milk bones, and that's not saying anything against milk bones or kibble, it's probably just not motivating enough versus that particular instance. Um, or you may be too close. You may be um, flooding your dog. Flooding is a, a trainer terminology. Basically, that just means that this is a, st a stimulation um, overload. Your dog is just not, they're not, they can't handle it. And I think a better way of thinking about this is if you yourself we're nervous about maybe going on stage, right? We're about to go on stage, uh, do, you know, give a really big speech. Um, you're not going to want to eat a, you know, a four course meal before you go out on that stage. You're probably feeling a little anxious, a little nauseated. So you want to make sure that you're working within the parameters that your dog can succeed and then giving them a, a reason to change their mind about things. So pairing these instances, again, two things, 
something that tastes really freaking good and providing plenty of distance away from a particular trigger. Um, I'm saying this very blanket terms because this doesn't matter what you are rehabilitating, whether you think it is because your dog feels a particular way about specific people um, or if they feel that way about other dogs or about objects like trash cans. A lot of dogs have averse reactions towards the silliest things, inanimate objects. It doesn't matter. Don't try to rationalize it too much because in all honesty, we think and we function separately than dogs. But dogs are far more simpler than humans. Their brains are not capable of these crazy complex thinking and rationality. And so when you see that your dog is acting a specific way, just see it for what it is and try to fix it. Create better management tactics, increase the distance, and pair it with something that's really gonna convince them to change their mind. Um, I think that really boils down with how you can help. Again, circling back to if you, if you can afford um, to find or seek out a professional rewards-based trainer, you are looking for someone who is looking to address an emotional issue within the dog. So you're not trying to treat a symptom. You know? You're not going to go to someone and be like, hey, um, I need my dog to just shut up. And, you know, and so slapping any type of particular tool, uh, an aversive tool, such as prong collars or shock collars, this isn't going to fix or mend a relationship. It is just going to put a Band-Aid on a problem and then potentially exacerbate those problems or make it worse. Um, so, so to make sure that you want to treat a problem, make sure that you are treating it from a, a positive standpoint. You know, make them feel better. Um, because if you make them feel better, you're going to feel better right? Because nobody wants to think about whether or not their dog is racist, so to speak. So if you feel like your dog feels better about all people in general, again, you will never have to ask yourself or anyone else that question or insinuate that that is um, a possibility. Um, I think that really, really circles, like really boils it down. Um, I think other than that, if you are trying to teach your dog other things, it also boils down to, do they even have their basics? Um, a lot of people, they, you know, they get it potentially like small dogs, for instance, a lot of times skip basic training with small dogs because they're little and they're easy to manage, but little dogs are the same as big dogs. And even though they are easier to pick up and, you know, and shove, you know, in a different room, that doesn't mean that if they weren't armed with the proper, um, training, if they weren't armed with just a way to communicate with you and other people around them more clearly, that can also help in your gray area of socialization. So when dogs are exposed to all these things and you're just expecting them to just know how to be, sometimes it really does help if you just teach your dog a simple sit or if you teach your dog a simple hand targeting uh, method to, to help them get out of situations in which they feel uncomfortable um, or if you teach them a stationing behavior so that if you are noticing a lunging type behaviors or reactive behaviors, you were teaching the dog that, hey, we don't really encourage this here. So how about we go hang out in this spot instead and encouraging all of these behaviors. Sometimes when socialization, when that window has passed, the best thing that you can do is equip your dog with a clean, clear dialogue between you and them. I love to remind people that dogs do not speak English. They do not speak Spanish. They don't speak any particular verbal language. They do, however, pick up on cues and your nuances. And you can make this even clearer if you set aside some time to just clean up the training. Do they actually know what you're asking them to do? If you're always, the other part of it is how your reactions around particular people um, is stemming from this. For instance, if, again, circling back to the, the imaginary UPS man, if your UPS man is black with a hat carrying a package and every time your dog charges the front door to bark at him and you're screaming, you're just reinforcing their feelings towards this particular person. So your reactions also um, influence how they feel about people around them. So making sure that you're honing that in. Do you have a way to communicate with them? If you don't, put some management into play and find a, a better, smarter way to communicate with your dogs. And if you have the ability to do so, hire a professional that can help you with rehabilitation. And if you don't have the ability to do so, try it yourself with a lot of distance and a lot of really, really good tasty stuff. 
And that's my best advice for people who are um, experiencing socialization, reactivity, or feeling like their dog feels some type of way about an ethnic group. I think that's, I think that covers it all. And one of the things you mentioned was, um, but I thought that was interesting, I'm going a little off script here, but um, one of the things that's that you mentioned was how people don't generally want to think that they're racist for, st for starters, but they generally right. don't want to think that their dogs are racist. And that was something that even Dr. Hawkins had mentioned in her paper, which is that her whole study was structured around self-reporting. So even though she had a large sample, all of the sample was people reporting to her of their own experiences. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that she, you know, had to face within the realities of that study is that people don't, people put forward their best selves. So even right. though they they collected a lot of data, particularly from whites and blacks, but particularly from the white community, they probably were sugarcoating a couple things, right? Because they want right. to put their best selves forward. Yeah. Um, and I think that's also one of the reasons why this information is so important. And it's particularly important that it's being put on YouTube because people can watch it in the comfort of their own rooms. Yes. No one's judging them and no one's, yeah, I'll get to you in a second, Taylor. Um, when no one is, is aware that they're having these thoughts and these questions. Absolutely. Right? What were you gonna say, Taylor? So I was just gonna bounce back on what you guys are saying, but I do think that um, body language, that human body language really tells them itself. So even if you think that you don't have any kind of racial bias, if you're acting in a way that is affecting your dog's behavior, which affects how they treat a certain individual, then you really have to check yourself and watch how you are, how you are responding. If you tighten up on the leash whenever a black person walks by and cert with certain clothes and, you, and maybe it's the same person, then maybe you are causing a dog to be reactive towards a certain person that's walking by because of how you were acting in that moment. We all know how leash reactivity can be easily caused by the human, by the person. So how are you acting? That really does um, come into play, okay? And also, who is also in, in that uh, region? I'm from New Orleans, live in New Orleans. New Orleans is a really high um, black population. You can't really say, oh, my dog is like black people if you always tighten up on the leash whenever a black person walks by in a predominantly black city, if it makes any sense. That's just you teaching your dog how to be reactive towards humans walking by. So really keep that into play. It's a really hard study um, answer to come to yourself without really looking at the whole situation as, as a whole, okay? Definitely. Mm -hmm. um, so if, if you're still, if I'm, if I'm still a learner and I'm new, I'm new in my journey of educating myself on just, not just, you know, um, diversity as it pertains to my dog, but just diversity as I live through my life, right? Um, and how I view the world. Um, I'm wondering if you can explain to me so that I can better understand how my dog is distinguishing the difference between, you know, racism and distinguishing between how a, 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 my prejudice against a person solely based off the skin of, you know, the color of their skin versus a phobia um, which might be a more hard ingrained fear. Yeah. Um, no, that's, that's a fantastic question. Um, looking at racism versus phobias. These are two different things. So I'm actually going to start this off by actually giving you the actual definitions of both of these. So first things first, the definition of racism is prejudice, discrimination, or antagonism towards against someone of a different race based on the belief that one's own race is superior. So that in and of itself, the based on the belief is telling, right? The other definition of a phobia is an extreme or irrational fear or aversion to something. And that something can be anything. So as you, as can, you can see, see, these two things are different. They seem similar, but they aren't because a phobia doesn't come from a place of rationale. A good example of this are people who are afraid of clowns. I am not afraid of clowns. I am. Um, I, <laughs> I am not afraid of clowns. I don't find them. And when you really think about it, for someone, for me, of rational thinking, thinking about clowns, 
Um, I don't find them scary. I don't, I think they were intended to be something that's supposed to be funny or enjoyable. So be, when someone does find clowns terrifying, you can't go down a rational rabbit hole. This is just, this is what it is. This person finds this scary and this is a phobia, just like a phobia of spiders, arachnophobia. Um, however, stemming from racism, racism is a choice. Um, like Taylor had mentioned earlier in this conversation, racism is a human construct. This is something that people have invented. This is something that only exists within humans and, and specifically speaking within humans. I cannot say based off of like other um, animal species. Like I cannot tell you if there's racism amongst monkeys or if there's racism amongst lions. I cannot attest to that, but I can tell you that within the human experience, racism is a choice. This is something that is either taught or brought up, but this is not a phobia, so to speak. There could be an argument that if somebody was, you know, raised in, in a situation in which they were taught this, they were never exposed to maybe a person of color that potentially it could be a phobia to some degree, but that is another conversation. And I still think that boils down to choosing to be ignorant about something. Dogs do not choose to be ignorant. They just are afraid. And that is really, really different. So boiling, getting back into this, how a phobia happens for dogs, typically a phobia to really instill in a dog and be mindful that every dog is different. And when it comes to learning, it is subjective to the learner, meaning that you do not get a choice in what this dog thinks, how, you know, you can try to influence their interactions with the world as best as possible. But inevitably, what they think, how they feel is completely up to them. So for a phobia to occur, typically some type of traumatic event needs to happen. There needs to be some form of trauma. And trauma can come in all these ma many different levels. Um, some dog may find a ladder falling, not even near them, just a ladder that fell, traumatic. It was loud, it was noisy, and now this dog has a phobia of ladders. I say this because objects, particular object phobias are very common in dogs. We have dogs who are phobic of trash cans. They just, they see a trash can and they suddenly, they cannot walk. They just, they find it terrifying. And for us, it seems extremely irrational. It makes walking very difficult because then you have to pick the dog up and bring them home. Um, but this is an example of, you know, maybe something happened to that dog. Maybe once when they were a puppy during a very impressionistic uh, portion of their puppy age, because puppies, when they are young, they are much more impressionable, typically. Um, maybe a trash can fell over. It doesn't have to be anything too extreme, right? Now, the reason that I circle to this is a lot of people have the assumption or, you know, the people who are saying, is my dog racist? They're asking that them to themselves. Do you actually have any particular moment that you can think or pinpoint that your dog has had a traumatic event with a particular person of color um, or a particular ethnic group? And given everything that we've already been talking about, you know, we say go down the list before you try to pinpoint this. However, I want to clarify that based off of all the scientific evidence that, you know, we're providing or we're talking about or, con or you know, really bringing in, you know, our understanding of things, this is inevitably a hypothesis. So given the benefit of the doubt that dogs could be racist, or, you know, I don't want to say racist, but they could discriminate based off of skin color, skin color, then you will have, you kind of need a moment in which would have influenced that dog's thinking. The dog isn't just born knowing that someone who is of darker skin color is scarier. Something could have happened, you know, for them to make the connection that, oh, that black guy dropped a box once and it was really loud. And so now I don't like black guys. And, and that's a ridiculous like thing to say out loud. But I, I like to say this, you know, trying to think of it in perspective of how a dog thinks. Um, this um, Hispanic woman who's elderly approached the fence you know, and tried to talk to the dog and maybe they found that approaching shuffling motion because maybe she can't walk that well, but she just so happened to be Hispanic. She has a skin, a, a tan skin tone like myself. Maybe, maybe the dog found that moment traumatic and maybe they could deduce that, you know, there was, there was a moment there. 
However, trauma typically has to be something a little bit more extreme than that. So what I would think that could validate trauma personally, a more rational line of thinking is let's say you rescued your dog or you got your dog from a rescue and that you were told that this dog came from a puppy mill and that this puppy mill was a bust and maybe the people who were working, who were um, retrieving these animals, rescuing these animals, so to speak, maybe that wasn't a very seamless um, operation. Maybe it was very traumatic, very scary for the dogs. And so maybe all of those people were people of color. But again, this is not likely. Many times, if, if there were a situation like this, it's, it's very hard to try and pinpoint the fact that, oh, the dog just saw the color. You, as you can probably already deduce at this point in this video, um, you're, you can probably start to see that color is just part, is just a very small portion of it. And in fact, it's probably all the other factors that would have made this traumatic. But again, circling back to this, this is a hypothesis and giving this the benefit of the doubt, we do believe that there would need to be some type of trauma that is specific to an ethnic, like it is very, very obvious that this person was black and this person maybe abused this dog or did something that scared this dog or in very evident, the dog was, was scarred by this, emotionally scarred. But if you have had this puppy since five weeks old, since three months old, since very young, or maybe you've had this dog since one year old, you know, maybe it doesn't really matter. If you can't really pinpoint a particular moment, then you really can't pass off the assumption that your dog is racist or they are discriminating based on color, so to speak. Right. And I hope that really um, clarifies, you know, phobias versus racism. Again, racism, a human construct. This is something that was invented by humans within humans. This is just to put each other down, essentially. Phobias, if it were possible for dogs to, ha to have a phobia for a particular skin color, it will have needed to be a very obvious traumatic event. Um, and it may have even needed to repeat itself more than once. A lot of times trauma happens over time. Very, it's not very often that a dog is faced with something and they're instantly traumatized. It's more often than not um, that they are constantly berated with something um, and their emotional needs are being ignored. And then that becomes trauma. So that's another aspect of trauma that it does typically have to reoccur. Sometimes in, in some events, some, some things only need to happen once. Um, but for the most part, I think many people can agree that dogs are pretty forgiving in terms of things that happen. So you don't necessarily want to just be like, oh, my dog saw a black guy once and they decided they were terrified. That's probably not a good enough uh, leg to stand on, so to speak. Okay. And one thing I, I wanted that. to, one thing I wanted to just mention, it's not quite a question, but a contribute. Uh, one of the things that Dr. Hawkins was writing in her discussion of her paper was just that, like we were talking about with people trying to put their best foot forward, um, the other thing that particularly white folks who have carried implicit bias one of the things that they often do is that they, their memories um, will attribute more significance to less relevant things. So for example, their memories are going to say, oh, I remember this one time my dog was barking at this guy and he happened to be black. They're, that moment is going to stand out more in their mind than all of the times that their dog also barked at all of these other people who were white. <laughs> yes. Um, so we want to, if, we're, if, you're, if you're a viewer right now and you are already thinking to yourself, oh, I remember this one time, so maybe that was a traumatic event for my dog. Something to be aware of yourself, to have that self-awareness is to think to yourself, am I remembering this moment because it actually was significant? Or am I remembering this moment because of my implicit bias is attributing too much significance mm -hmm. to it? Right. Yeah. We see this a lot, um, I'm kind of off topic, we see this a lot with um, new clients going into dog training in general. They think, oh, my dog is, I think my dog's afraid of X, Y, and Z. And then we come in as trainers, actually it's more than this, is something else. Oh, my dog barks at the door. And we ask them, okay, well, what exactly are they barking at? Are they barking at a sound behind the door? Is the door, is it, does the door creak a certain way when it opens? When are they barking at the door? 
So basically what we're trying to say is we want you guys to kind of act like trainers and really play detective. What exactly is happening in this moment? And can you pinpoint other times in your dog's life where they reacted very similarly or the same way? Sometimes the way our dogs react isn't always the exact same way all the time. Sometimes they may, maybe one day they may growl, next day they may be quiet. So you really have to keep in mind, okay, what has happened in this moment? And like you said, don't put too much thought into it, but catalog it, okay? It walked this way at this time, but this other time it wasn't really the same way. And I really hope that makes sense. I think one more for dog owners is that, and I, I'm not sure if I had already mentioned this, but very seldomly is a problem, uh, whether a socialization issue, an isolated issue. More often than not, when you are seeing a dog who you know, has a particular response to a particular trigger, they also have other problems. Typically, anxiety isn't something that just exists in one realm. So your dog is not only fearful of this one thing. A good example of this is uh, my personal dog. My dog, Beetlejuice, is fearful of children because of his young interactions with children. They were not the best. They, he found them traumatic. It seemed okay. It was not okay. And therefore, he is now reactive towards children. However, he also has no, no, uh, noise phobias. He is afraid of thunderstorms. So this really attributes to the personality of my dog. My dog is a naturally anxious dog. And so I think as dog owners, it's really important to admit to yourselves that your dog may not be as confident as you think they are, or as you want to believe that they are. It is okay to admit, even late, later on in the game, it does not matter if you have a one-year-old dog or a 10-year-old dog. It is okay to admit that you haven't seen the signs, and it is not okay to try and pinpoint it on a singular moment based off of biases, you know, because if you have been ignoring these other things, but then the only thing that sticks out in your mind is, oh, my dog barks at black people, then you really are looking more so at a self-reflection than really looking at what's going on with your dog. So be okay with admitting that your dog may not be as confident as they are, and then try to tackle that problem. Try to help them with their confidence and what's awesome about doing this is that this will also help you with your confidence in your dog. Feigning confidence is not confidence, but actually working on it will make you a far more confident, loving, and understanding dog owner, and your dog will love you that much more for really putting in the work. I think that's really important for people to know. Don't fake the confidence. Are they really confident? Have they been anxious their entire life? Right. I think you already answered what I'm about to say, Gio, but I want to add that sometimes though, as dogs age, sometimes their behavior change. So if there was a mild behavior that happened when they were younger, it's possible that that mild behavior may become ex exponentially worse at a certain age or after a certain triggering event. A good example of bringing up our dogs, my dog Sashi has always been a little weary about storms, but we had a particular storm two weeks ago, I'll never forget this. This storm had so much thunder and lightning, and it was loud throughout the entire night. After that storm, I noticed an increase of her anxious behavior towards storms. And this happened in the span of two, three weeks. So watching the behavior and watching how it can become a little bit worse or a little bit better, depending on what you're doing, it's really important to keep that in mind. And like Gio said, always have your dog's emotional needs in mind. Do what you can to make their lives as stress-free as possible. Um, talk to your talk to your vet, going to a veterinary behaviorist if you could go to a veterinary behaviorist, or even going to a fear free veterinarian to help you find medicine for your dog, meds. We've been going on, uh, we, Gio and I have been researching a lot on meds recently for our own dogs and for our dogs that we're servicing in our community. Don't be afraid to reach out for other means of help. Definitely. Um, anything... The, so in a second, I want to kind of transfer over to some of your personal experiences. Mm -hmm. um, but before we do that, is there anything else that we haven't covered? I think that's it. I think we've covered everything. We've everything. covered um, the complexity of humans. We've yeah. covered um, the complexity of dogs, how we think they perceive the world. So I think that's it. So I think you, you can go ahead and answer your question. Ask your question. Uh, well, no, I'll turn the floor to you guys, and I just mm -hmm. want to hear some of your personal stories. What are your personal experiences? How have they affected your training? That sort of thing. 
So the first thing I want to start off with is with our personal experience, we haven't personally seen dogs react to our skin tone. Myself, nor Gio, and nor have we reported our clients saying that their dogs have um, responded to our skin tone, which is important. I'm a black person, so I want to see what I see in my in my vision. But it's important to have. Okay, my client is saying, okay, there is no difference, and in fact, dogs tend to warm up to warm up to Gio and I much faster than any other stranger if they have an issue with strangers. So before I go into that and more other personal experiences, I also want to bring up the fact that. Even though we believe that dogs don't really discriminate between ethnic groups in terms of skin color, we do find evidence, of course, of dogs discriminating amongst each other within the species, of course. So we really want to explain that dogs do discriminate amongst other dogs. Sometimes they prefer other certain temperaments or even they prefer to be around dogs of similar size or even breed as them, which is we see, see, see this all the time. A good example is Geo's dog, Beetlejuice. He loves fluffy dogs, and we always joke about how much he loves smaller, fluffy dogs. My dog, Suri, in particular, I've noticed that she loves, she's a terrier. I've noticed that she loves terriers of her size, and she seems to always want to play with them whenever we go to the dog park and things like that. So we see this all the time. Some dogs prefer mild temperaments. Most dogs prefer mild temperaments and things like that. Other personal experience moving away from the dogs, um, we also, we used to work for um, certain uh, doggy daycare, and we would see a case where um, a client would come in and say, hey, you know, I'm so happy you guys take care of my dog, but we've noticed that I think my dog doesn't really like black people that much. Bring it back to the original question. I don't think, are they racist, X, Y, and Z? What that client didn't realize at the time was that most of the workers that work with that dog were either black or of color. So they didn't know this until so they came in with their with the assumption, oh, I don't know if my dog likes X, Y, and Z. And we will say, okay, but you know, most of us are of color, so we don't really think it's the case. And your dog seems to seem to really love us, really, really enjoy being around us as any other dog would be. And I also want to bring up the point that um, dogs raised in of color household do not seem to behave any differently than dogs brought up in white household, which is really important to bring up, bring up that fact. Um, my dogs in particular, they have rarely been around white people, but when they see a white person, they don't react differently from seeing a black person or another person of color. In particular, my dog, Sashi, that has, she has the fear of people, strangers, walking towards her in a direct line. It's very confrontational. It could be a white, black, or any of uh, any of color person, and she will still react the exact same way. So I have pinpointed her fear as being, okay, you are afraid of strangers walking towards you on the sidewalk or in the aisle in the store. So I need to work on people approaching you or X, Y, and Z. So it versus me thinking, oh, maybe it's a white person, a black person. It's not. Typically, it's a human walking towards her. And like Gio said earlier, it's really important that we that you guys looking to hire a trainer or behaviors to help you pinpoint exactly what your dog is reacting to. I just gave you an example of what I pinpointed my dog react reacts to. So I want you to do the same thing, hire a trainer and make sure you really narrow in that cause. Um, and personally as trainers, um, training dogs, I said earlier that we did not, we've never noticed dog react to our skin tone. However, we have seen dogs react to different shapes that we may have one day. So, for example, I have an afro, and if you notice, it's, it's on my head. If I had to look at myself in the mirror, love what I see, of course, uh, it's a circle on my head. So, typically, human heads are pretty flat, right? I'm sure most dogs have seen, if, if they have been around primarily white, white people, then flat heads, hair that's kind of flat on the head. Meanwhile, my hair is on top of my head. So, one time I went to um, a client's house, and the dog was like, whoa, did you change your hair? Last time you hear your hair was down, now it's up, what's going on? And the dog was reacting in a way to the shape of my head. We also see sometimes where dogs react to our voices. Sometimes dogs actually warm up to me. So just give you guys a good example. Gio and I both train together. So we both go into the home. So that, that makes it a little, a little more complex for the dogs to understand when two people walk into the home. So you have me and my afro and going to our voices, my voice is a little bit softer than Geo's, so sometimes some dogs warm up, warm up to me faster. Her voice is very low, very soft. Meanwhile, her voice resonates. It's a little bit deeper. So voices, the shape of our heads, what we're wearing, 
um, we use, sometimes we walk around with um, uh, a halter or a tree pouch on our uh, hip. If I had a large tree pouch one day, the dog would be like, okay, well, I guess there's more treats in there. But also, you look a little funny. Your shape, your shape kind of weird. What's going on here? We've also had dogs react to us wearing masks, of course, because we are covering half of our face. So they're not used to seeing this. You've seen this, not this. So keep that in mind. So again, I'm going to reiterate this. What we've personally seen dogs respond to more are our voices, our shapes, but primarily how we carry ourselves. So when we walk into a home, Gio and I are very deliberate in how we walk into a client's home. Sometimes it's very slow. Our heads are not staring directly at the dog who's looking away. Sometimes we're tossing treats away from us to get the dog away from the front door, making them realize you don't have to come to me yet. Do what you want to do over there and come to me on your own volition. This is important, guys, and I'm going to say this for everyone. The way you approach dogs or the way you allow people to approach your dog really does determine how that dog will react to that person. So if your dog reacts to strangers or you think your dog reacts to a particular type of stranger, keep in mind that, like Gio said earlier, maybe your dog isn't that secure. Maybe your dog isn't that confident. So maybe they shouldn't be greeting company or strangers at your front door. And if that stranger isn't well-versed in dog behavior, maybe they come in, oh, puppy, oh, this, oh, this. If you guys can put yourself in a dog's point of view, this is very intimidating. And I'm going to bring it back to New Orleans. We have a very, um, very confident city. People are very uh, sociable here. So we have a dog that is often walked on the street that's pretty busy. And this dog seems to like people, but sometimes people come up to this dog, oh, can I pet your dog? And the dog became more weary of people interact, per human interaction because the humans continuously invaded their space, didn't listen, and the human, the owner, the client, didn't know how to stop the other person and then they weren't their dog's best advocate. So keep that in mind. The way humans in interact with dogs really does shape the, how the dog think of us. And I would say first impressions with dogs do matter sometimes. So it's really important that you approach your dog in a non-confrontational way. Have strangers, if your dog is okay with strangers, approach your dog in a non-confrontational way. I, honestly, ideally, I would prefer if strangers do not approach my dogs I want them to let me, I want them to wait for me. You know what? Give me a second. Let me see if my dogs want to meet you. Because a lot of times, a lot of dogs do not want to interact with other people. They don't want to interact with strangers. So it's important that listen to your dog. Do you want, see if, watch the body language. We can't talk to them, unfortunately. Watch the body language. See if they want to approach that person. If they are walking towards me on volition in a confident body, body language way, then go ahead and let them, okay, his treats, ego, it could complete their react, um, interaction. But it's important that we don't force dogs into interaction, like Gio said. And also, we want to make sure that we are very aware of how we are approaching them. So, again, do not directly stare at them. Do not put your hands on them. Do not try to touch their head and other things like that. And we can definitely talk about that more in the future. But it's really important how you approach them. And like I said, they, the dogs that we've, uh, we've worked with seem to really respond more to, again, our voices, our shapes, but also how we move towards them, like I just said. If we're moving really fast, if we're moving very slow, we work with a lot of dogs that seem to be weary of people moving really fast, which makes sense. Fast movement really means, usually means that either something may fall, or maybe that person is going to come to me, or maybe the dog can't really understand what she's about to do so fast, okay? Um, so I think something that I want to say uh, to people who are maybe confused about how their dogs are reacting um, based off of experience is if you feel like your dog has a particular issue and you're not exactly sure why, don't necessarily be afraid to, don't withhold the information. Let's say you are actually seeking out help and you don't know a better way to say this other than asking the question, is my dog racist? Um, as a person of color, I can only speak for myself, but I can say that between Taylor and myself, we are not hypersensitive, so to speak, when it comes to uh, training animals. It, we are very aware that when people approach us with questions and with help, uh, you know, looking for guidance, they are essentially coming from a good place because anyone who is asking these questions, who are looking to make amends essentially 
Uh, sometimes the best way to ask a question is the most crass way to ask a question. And I am a known potty mouth. There will be, there's no potty mouth in this video, but I am a known potty mouth. And I have a tendency to say um, exactly what I'm thinking. And so if that is exactly what you are thinking, just ask it. And, and a professional will, should be happy to guide you and should be ha happy to help you pinpoint what the actual problem is. Um, because I think genu genuinely with dogs and, you know, there is, there's a lot of mixed information out there, especially here on this platform of YouTube, a lot of mixed information in relation to how dogs function, how they think. The best thing that you can do for yourself is just ask. So if you don't know how to ask the question, whether it is, is my dog racist? Or maybe you word it in a sense where you're like, I suspect my dog has feelings about people of color. You know, if that makes you feel better to, to word that question a better way. But the biggest thing that I want to tell people is don't be afraid to ask any question in relation to your dog. But with that being said, be very open to the answer. Do not ask this question with the assumption that you're going to get the answer that you expect because professionals are going to give you a professional answer. Mm -hmm. And if you are asking a question to be validated, then you will be upset with the answer that you will get because your answer should come from a professional standpoint and should come from a place of non-bias, objectivity, and research and science. So make sure that if you are tentative to ask the question, but you really, it really is coming from a good place, maybe word it differently, but don't withhold the information. And the reason I say this is that um, maybe it's the only way that you think to word potential reactivity or aggression. It's extremely important to mention these things before you invite someone into your home. Because if the only way you knew how to ask is my dog racist, but you decided not to ask at all, and then someone who walks into your home gets bit, then the responsibility lies on you. You didn't ask in a, in a better sense. And I hope that makes sense. So not wanting to scare people away, mostly looking to educate you. But again, if you don't know a better way, just ask the question. And most people of color who are in a professional field are willing to answer this question from a professional standpoint. We understand the ignorance or the lack of knowledge that's out there. This isn't available. This is probably the only maybe one, two or three videos on YouTube that even so much as address this particular question. So if this is the only way you know how to ask the question, then damn it, ask the question. <laughs> um, I wanted to circle back to um, how our behavior could affect their behavior. We said that many times in this segment, but it's really important to recognize we are saying we're saying all these points we're going over the science and our experiences we are saying this and with the assumption that you are a clean slate meaning that you have no implicit bias that you don't treat people any differently but if you do treat people differently when you're with your dog then really um, try to change the way you behave if you need to take a step back and kind of do the same thing we do with dogs have some distance um be more confident go out to the more places or maybe um, don't go out so often. Don't go out when it's, it's so crowded. It's up to you. You figure out how to make yourself more confident. But if you are treating people differently and you're with your dog and your dog and your dog picks up on that, then yes, I can see your dog starting to react differently. I also want to address the not so common cases where we hear people say that their dog doesn't like one particular person, regardless of skin color. This is, I think this can also be related to this topic. So sometimes we hear people saying, oh, my dog does not like my uncle. He loves everybody in my family, but he does not, he hates my uncle. Or a good example, my dog does really well with everyone I know, but seems to hate my brother or hate my child. So it's really important to know if, number one, if that person is not family and maybe they are of a different skin color and this person is a friend of yours, say it's a friend of yours and they come over to your house, has your dog and your friend ever had a weird reaction to where your dog was weary? Maybe that person came in and dropped a ladder, like Gio said. Maybe they're carrying a ladder into your home and then dropped the ladder, and now your dog has feelings towards whenever that person comes over. It doesn't have to do with skin tone. Skin tone it has to do with that time where the ladder dropped and the dog remembers that. Maybe I'm just making assumptions, but we hear often of people saying, "Oh, I don't know if my dog likes this person." And we always say, "Well, 
can you think of anything that happens when that person comes over or can you think of any instance of where that person acts strange around that dog which is really common sometimes people say oh i don't think i think you have bad vibes so my dogs act, act weird towards you and i say well i don't know about vibes but has that person ever acted weird towards your dog is that person afraid of dogs really common is a person afraid of dogs so whenever your that dog your dog goes towards that person the person's like oh no they stop or they already are so terrified and dogs well, they can sense fear so keep that in mind and really look into how your dog reacts to all kind of people and also fix yourself so you aren't treating people differently that makes your dog react to people differently and i hope that makes sense Yep. I think um, last thing I want to say about personal experience, because I know that was the initial question. Um, personally, same answer as Taylor, no direct personal experience based on my skin color. Now, granted, I am tan. I have a tan skin color. In the summer, I'm a little bit darker, but I'm, I'm really not that dark. I'm not black. I am Puerto Rican. Um, so I have a tan skin color. Um, and I have not ever experienced a dog feeling threatened by me because of my skin tone. And in fact, the reason why we say that we can pinpoint particular moments when we would walk into a home and is because I would speak and my voice is pretty deep for a female. It does resonate. And so it would be the moment that I spoke when the dog would bark. It wouldn't have been the moment, you know, when you walk into someone's home or if you're walking up to their fence line, dogs are naturally typically, unless you have the world's friendliest dog, but in my experience, most dogs are just pretty suspicious to begin with. Like they're going to be studying, looking, why are you walking upon my territory type thing? And um, it wasn't until the moment that I spoke that would sometimes set the dog over the edge where I should have remained quiet just a little bit longer, maybe not reading the signs. Again, I'm a professional, so I can see the signs. Um, but that is really my direct experience. And I, again, I was raised in a household Puerto Rican household, we're all tan. Um, and, you know, our dogs were actually outside dogs. And in to, admittedly, sometimes we would have neighborhood friends who would come by. And sometimes, you know, we would think, oh, well, it's maybe they're barking excessively because they're black and we're tan, you know, because that would be the ignorant blanket answer for it. Oh, they just look different than us. But honestly, like, um, like you mentioned earlier, Jenna, it really is just the moments where it stuck out in her head that it actually didn't matter what, you know, they barked at everybody. And it actually was the fact that these people, maybe they were approaching our gate because they were coming to swim in our pool. And our dogs always barked at people who, who walked up to the gate. And this was actually something that was very common even at nighttime because they couldn't see us. And if we walked and were maybe throwing something away in the trash that was near the gate, the dogs would lose it. And it was us. So it really, it doesn't, it didn't really matter when I, when we really think back and we look back, it really boiled down to a lack of socialization. Again, these were outside backyard dogs. They were loved. They were well-fed. They had their own house. Essentially, there was a whole house for the dogs in the back, but these were not dogs that were mingling with the masses. These were not dogs that were constantly exposed to different types of people or stimuli. So when something new was brought to them, they barked at it and it was very natural and it was natural for us to assume that it was because of skin color, because that's what we see first. Um, but now, again, a little more educated, and now ending you know, towards the end of this video, you can see things more for the, the full picture, essentially. It's yeah. not just about color, it's about the entire picture. What's going on here? I like yeah. that you said that, because like I said earlier, it's like onions are layers. We are, we have a lot of layers as humans, so you can't really say it's the skin color you see first. So. Right, and I think um, one of the things that we always talk about as trainers is that, you know, novelty can come at any time in the dog's life. There's always something new. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously the number of experiences you give them in the early stages are going to give them the adaptability that they need to handle novelty later on. Uh, but, you know, I think if you live in a predominantly white neighborhood, and you just, it's not that you, you believe you're not racist, um, but you just don't get the exposure to other people of color, then your dog's not going to either, right? Especially if you just don't take your dog places. If your dog knows the, you know, 10 minute radius of your house and that's it, then your dog is only going to have that exposure. And so the one day that you have 
you know, your movers come over and the mover happens to be black and the mover happens to come in and he's, you know, it's, he's facing a novel thing. Mm -hmm. There are so many variables there that are new, right? Yeah, right? It's not just that the dog is experiencing maybe his first black person. Maybe that's what comes to the human mind, but what comes to the trainer's mind and what comes to the dog's mind is person never comes to my house and there he is. He's walking around making a whole bunch of ruckus. He never is supposed to do that. He's a male. Maybe I, I, I have an affinity more towards females anyway, right? So there's all of these other variables that we want to take into consideration. And, you know, I think that race skin color needs to be the very, very, very last variable that comes into that consideration. Mm -hmm. um, go ahead, Taylor. I saw your hand first. I, um, I'm really glad you said that. Um, we tend, we never want to say that we strive for perfection in dog training or socialization. It is literally impossible to socialize for everything that we can think of with humans. However, I really happy that you said that the 10 minute radius or your suburb or your cul-de-sac of um, white neighbors isn't really the human experience totally. If you want your dog to come to come with you to the cafes or bars, then they have to be socialized to many different kinds of people, types of people, and all shapes and sizes. It's really important that we consider that. So thank you for saying that. That's what I want to say. Yeah. yeah. Um, I have I have two additional points. Um, the first one is again. Um, you know, bouncing off of, you know, a gentleman who maybe who is of color who might be doing some housework, you know, and he just so happens to be of color. I think another thing that we need to be mindful of is this actually is a play off of behavior. And typically people of different ethnicities, um, people of color, I can, I can say for myself that Puerto Ricans are very exuberant. We speak with our arms, we are loud, and, and that's not to talk for, you know, that's not to speak for every Puerto Rican, but I can attest to my household and for every Puerto Rican that I know that we are loud. And so if a dog is raised in a household that is white and quiet, it's also, okay, this is, there's so much newness. Again, there's so much going on there. So again, it's easy to pinpoint it as the color, but it may just be the culture, the entire culture, the situation is just new to a dog. It's not something that they're accustomed to. And then, um, so, you know, let's say, you know, you do have a, a person of color, your dog has never been exposed to anyone of color. And let's say it is, we want to give it the benefit of the doubt, even though we don't think that it would pinpoint to color, but let's pinpoint to color. Let's say a very dark person of skin tone comes into your home and you guys are not dark. You're very light, fair skin tone. Um, I would like to say that if your dog does have a verse reaction to a skin tone, if that's what we decide, if a trainer, if a professional were to pinpoint it to the color of someone's skin based off of the situations that presented themselves, maybe this person walked in naked. Maybe we're all naked and we have decided that, okay, it's definitely skin tone because nothing else can be influencing this decision. Then I just want to say that if it was something as simple as color, rehabilitating this would be pretty easy. This is not something that would be very complex. Um, what is typically more complex to rehabilitate is movement, sounds, temperaments, things of more complex natures, things that people wear. Humans in general will be more complex, but if it were just color, that would be the easiest thing in the world typically to just, oh, I need you to be okay with this color okay, so here's the treat, there's the color, here's the treat, there's the color. And if it were that simple, um, then the problem probably wouldn't have existed in the first place. And I think that in and of itself is a tell that it isn't the color, it's actually the entire situation because the fix would be so simple. Yeah. Right. Okay. And that kind of that kind of leads into the difference between sort of like the fear of the unknown versus like a phobia, which is, mm -hmm. you know, fear of, of a specific distinct event. Yes. Um, you know, more anxiety ridden phobia, uh, whereas, you know, a lot of fear just stems from, I don't know this thing. I don't know what this means. I don't know what's going to happen. Um, and to be honest, like you said, if it's really just a matter of they've never had experience with a dark skinned six foot five man, and this is their very, very first time, that is so simple to fix. <laughs> like, yeah. You know, it just ha throw a bunch of treats, make it a positive experience. And as long as the guy is doing anything halfway decent as, of a human being, it's going to be fine. Yep. Um, and I think that 
you know, I think as more as we educate people, I, that's one of the reasons I think doing this in YouTube form is so important is because like I was saying before, the more we can get people to secretly Google this and secretly educate themselves, um, it's okay. It doesn't need to be something that they brag and they say, today I learned, right? <laughs> Um, it can be something that we really did in secret, but it's okay because it changes your relationship with your dog for the better. And it changes every dog you're going to have for now until you die. Every dog mm -hmm. after today is going to have a better relationship with the world from what you learn. Um, so, you know, in total, um, if, if I just sat down with you guys today and I had no absolute information on anything prior to this, what I would be my biggest tech takeaways would be that first and foremost, racism, race is a human construct. Yes. And that to project that onto the minds of dogs who are not able to understand these more complex, vague, uh, concepts um, is not necessarily appropriate um, that we need to be a little bit more reductionistic for them because that's how their brains work um, and that additionally while it's true that dogs can discriminate between different types of things it's more has to do with uh, height and you know how much space the person is taking up what is the person wearing is what is the you know what is the voice of the person sound like um what is the context of their actions are they leaning forward are they making a brace of quick movements are they moving too slow are they walking towards the dog um the their actions need to be examined so there's all of these other things that we need to examine and clear out before we resolve to what is the color of their skin. Mm -hmm. um, and not are we doing that just because that's the ethical human thing to do, but we're doing that because that's what the dog is perceiving. Mm -hmm. That it's likely that the dog is seeing all of these things before they're even remotely considering what shade of skin the person has, you know, um, they're, they're looking at these other things first. And so that's why we're looking at them first. Um, additionally, we need to be making sure that we are giving every dog, but especially our puppies opportunities to be exposed in diverse situations, um, that fit all different hair types and clothing types and voices um, and we need to be giving them opportunities to be exposed to those things and have positive outcomes because it's not just enough to take your dog to the park and be like today we saw a girl with big hair so that's fine <laughs> right <laughs> we need to make sure that there's a positive outcome to it um and we also need to make sure that we are if if we've missed that critical learning period if we have a three-year-old seven-year-old year old dog, um, that we are giving ourselves opportunities to um, think about our dog's perspective of the world yeah. and um, thinking from their eyes, thinking from their lens and not projecting too much of our perspective into them. Yes. Um, did I cover your big bullets pretty well? You covered everything yes. really well. <laughs> And I think to like put it all together towards the end, I find that Gio and I find that dogs are very, I want to say optimistic, but they seem to meet us just the way they meet anyone else. And just because we are trainers and we know how to greet or how to introduce ourselves to dogs, they seem to really don't mind or care or notice what color skin tone I am or Geo is. They care more about the treats I have and if I'm going to give it to them, which is the biggest point. So I, I really do think dogs see us as just human, no matter what skin tone we are. And if we just consider that they see us all as just human, and if we start changing the way or fixing the way we interact with dogs, we're going to find that dogs will start to not react so unfavorably because we understand how to not encroach on their space or do other things that may lead to them reacting unfavorably. Yeah. Um, so 
Uh, one thing that I did want to, to just say is, you know, I'm really glad that, that your your emphasis on the dog's ability to distinguish between other triggers as far as like, you know, the sound of voice or the type of hair or what you're wearing or, you know, maybe there's a certain movement that they don't like, those sorts of things, uh, particularly because hair, because... Right now, my hair is really long, but for a good chunk of my professional career, I had short hair, mm -hmm. and my hair is really thick, and so you've probably seen a couple of my videos, it's like really big, right? And when it was short, it was even bigger, mm -hmm. and so a lot of times, uh, that would be very frightening to dogs, um, and so I would actively put my hair up in ponytails all the time, mm -hmm. because I just didn't want that to be a concern for the dog, um, but I, I distinctly remember talking to my students about that and being like oh yeah this is why i wear my hair up right it would just like come up flippantly and it would like blow their mind they're like what do you mean people don't you know dogs don't like big hair mm -hmm. <laughs> like they, it was something that they had never conceived before mm -hmm. and so when you said that i was just thinking i can totally see how yeah, that yeah. would be something that people overlook <laughs> To give you a, fun, a funny story or how I carry myself. So I do this, I, I put my hair up like this or I have an afro and I did it on purpose too. Um, I, I'll kind of want the dogs that I work with know from the get-go what to is, expect from me. So expect a weird shaped head, expect um, a softer voice, uh, expect the person that may subconsciously rock back and forth because this is what I do. So I want the dogs to be a custom okay this is what this is what you have to get used to so let's work from the base so we have a dog recently um who was really fearful of strangers um you will see her in the video of ours if you go to our youtube um she was very fearful of geo and i and i remember going to our client's house you know what we're going to be quiet i'm going to let her sniff me sniff my bag sniff geo and really let her get to know us and our client reported that this dog never um, seemed to want to any stranger. And it's kind of patting ourselves on the back. But by the second session, this dog was like, I like you guys. Oh, my goodness. So a dog that is extremely fearful of strangers, and we have two strangers, one with an afro, <laughs> one with a deep voice, two coming in. And we all think I'm going happy right here. But with huge backpacks, this dog was able to kind of get over her insecurities by the second session because we made sure to, you know, we're going to come in nice and easy. Here's what to expect. If this was too much, and we had had a case one time where us being there was too much, then we're going to take a step back, backtrack, and make sure we make it very easy for the dogs. But, yeah, if you'll be surprised what your dogs do react to. But also, you'll be surprised by how fast dogs can kind of overcome their insecurities if we give them a chance. Oh. Much faster than people much faster <laughs> much faster yeah no perfect dog uh, it doesn't exist there's also there's gonna be something your dog may react to maybe not so extreme you know but there is no perfect dog and we have to understand that and there's no perfect socialization program we can try our best to do x y and z but it's okay if new things come up we do find that dogs are just kind of random we do find that dogs who have gone through training have tools in their toolbox tend to handle novelty situations way better than dogs that have nothing. Oh, I'm, I'm a little nervous about that, but I, my mom is right here. We learned eye contact. I learned sit. I learned how to U-turn. I learned how to leave it. So I'm going to do one of these things versus a dog that has nothing in their toolbox. They're probably going to react to new, <laughs> to new novelty things in a way that's going to be a very fearful reaction. So keep that in mind, too. <laughs> yeah, definitely. We look forward to seeing it. We look forward to seeing um, Curtis's side. Um, thanks so much for doing it. Um, thanks, for, thanks for being brave enough, I think, to do it, because I think that's, that has a lot to do with, um, you know, who had the cojones to ask the question. Uh, seems like Jenna did. So Honestly, I'm glad that we can help you. At the time, I didn't think it was anything to be brave about. <laughs> at the time, I was just like, this sucks. This, there's not really good stuff on the internet. I have a YouTube channel. I should do it. <laughs> well, I'm, happy, I'm happy you feel that way because as <laughs> dog trainers who are practicing science, I guess you can call us, we should be able to answer these questions relatively simply. Like, no, I think that's way more than what you, the skin tone. If there is skin tone, there's so many levels before that. But also, we can't really shy away from the questions that our clients may potentially ask us, you know. 
a client hasn't asked us directly besides on the doggy daycare experience about um, if my dog likes or doesn't like black people. But if they did ask, then even though it makes me uncomfortable, I will still answer the question, feelings aside. You know what? Let me educate you on to why it's highly unlikely, if that makes any sense. So that's how I could tackle it. And I'm happy that you did call us, though, because I feel like giving a perspective from a black and a person person is that we can tell you from personal experience how dogs literally not treat us any differently. We, they act the same way. If anything, they treat us really well because we are trainers. We know how to respond to dogs, but just keeping that in mind. So I'm really, I am glad that even though you could answer the question yourself, you still came to us for our experience and our opinion on it, which is really awesome. And we really appreciate it. Absolutely. No, I yeah. wouldn't, like I said, I wouldn't have done it any other way. I mean, I, I, as soon as I saw that there was a, lack of quality information i immediately knew that i needed to make a video but i was like i'm not the one to make the video does that make sense right. so i was like how am i gonna do this <laughs> like, yeah. and i immediately went into problem solving mode and like i said at the time i really a didn't realize i didn't realize it was going to be as um like you said brave okay. I, didn't, I didn't think of it that way and secondly okay. i really didn't realize that we're going to be unwilling <laughs> to participate. Right. Like I, I, that took me by a surprise. Um, and so it just kind of motivates me that much more to, to comment on it and to, to put that video out there to inform. And to your guys's point, you know, I think the, the fact that anyone who clicks on the YouTube video is they've already proven that they're better than the people who didn't click on it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yep. They've already bettered <laughs> themselves just by clicking on it. And particularly my long form video, because I'll, now I'll have two, right? I'll have yeah, right. the condensed version and I'll have the longer version. Anybody who's sitting through the two hour video, y'all get a trophy, right? Yeah. Right. <laughs> Because uh, clearly you're doing something right in the world, and I, my only hope, to be completely honest, is that trainers especially decide to commit the time to watch the longer video, because mm -hmm. they're the ones who should already know this information. Clearly they feel uninformed in it. Here you go. Here's all you need to know. <laughs> That's how I feel about well, it. And at the very least, I hope you know, if they, if they did feel uncomfortable answering the question, um, maybe it was because they didn't know how to answer the question. So at the very least, I hope that they find a way um, to navigate a sensitive question and answer it in the most scientific way possible. And also see that two women of color have no problem answering this question and therefore, and then backed all of it with as much science as we could. And therefore, you should be able to answer this question, which as much science as you can, frame the answer correctly, and you won't be offending anybody. Honestly, somebody's going to get offended. Oh, well. <laughs> At the end of the day, but all we can do is do our best and educate everyone. And if they choose not to heed it, that's the nature of the world. <laughs> right. And what I like about this particular video is that it's not... Um, positive dog training focus per se right this this right. is a video that no matter what method you align with you can apply you can relate to this video you can mm -hmm. relate mm -hmm. to this information it immediately impacts you and your dog and so therefore any trainer can can gain right. information from this um and so I, I you know i like i said before I really don't know yet if you guys realize how much your voices are going to be helping dog professionals moving forward, because just as you said, you are giving them an opportunity to find the right verbiage and be able mm -hmm. to articulate <laughs> their sentiments and their, their, right. their science, right? Um, and if they didn't have that, that language before, hopefully after watching this, they do. Um, so I think I find you guys both so, so impressive. You're both very articulate. You're very uh, introspective. You're very aware of yourselves. I just, I'm just such fans. Plus you have like the baddest marketing on the planet. <laughs> and I just love it so much. <laughs> I'm like serious. Yes, it is amazing. Hey, okay. well, I think this is yeah. really cool. All right, guys. Sure, awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. I'll have talk to you soon. Um, okay.
So we are here with Curtis Kelly. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Where are you from? What is your program? That sort of thing. Hi, my name is Curtis Kelly, and I am the founder and lead dog trainer of Pet Parent Allies, based here in Philadelphia. We started. I started the program in 2018 after a little tiny uh, facility that I worked for called Zoom Room here in Philadelphia uh, shut down and I saw an opportunity for and a, a desperate need for more positive training uh, here in the city. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, and I know you recently wrote a, po a Instagram post revolved around um, the topic of whether or not dogs can be a racist. Um, and in a second, we're going to, we're going to get into that, but I do want our viewers to know that's the inspiration for this video. This video is happening because Curtis is a uh, post. And, um, so we're very grateful that you've been willing to come on our channel and talk about this. Um, so let, let's, let's just start with a very fundamental, um, level of questioning. Okay. I am a potential client. I have my little Bichon Frise, and I come to you and I say, Curtis, I don't understand, but my dog seems to treat black people differently than white people, and I just don't know, is my dog a racist, right? What do you say? Well, as a professional, the immediate response is, no, your dog is not a racist. Um, and the other thing that, uh, people should know is that while there might objectively be something different about the way that little Bijan handles certain people rather than others, might even specifically treat Black people differently, but those things are never in a vacuum. Um, and if this was an adopted dog, um, you may have had some things go awry in this dog's life. However, it's a Bichon, so suspect. More likely, um, of this little Bichon, this person is coming and uh, they are transmitting something to this dog when they are around people of color. Um, that this dog is picking up on and deciding, oh, this is something that I should be uncomfortable with for some reason. Um, for instance, uh, tension through the leash out on walks is a huge communicator um, for dogs. So whenever, if you have a dog who's leash reactive, people tend to have a tendency to very quickly exacerbate that because they start realizing their dog might react poorly to another dog. And so they see another dog and instantly the dog feels that yank, looks around, oh, there's a dog there, I must have been right. Dogs must be the issue when uh, initially that dog just reacted to the other dog had super aggressive and stiff body language as it was walking, but is otherwise fine with dogs. Um, so the same thing could easily happen with people. If a person stiffens up as they see a black person walking by, which I've had happen to me, um, people have stiffened up in my presence, even as I was walking the goofiest, most friendly dogs possible. Um, that's something that, that's information that their own dog is taking in and making a guess about what could be going on. So, so, so it sounds like you're saying like there is perhaps this implicit bias that the owner is either consciously or subconsciously um, doing an action, say holding tighter on a leash or going in a different direction. There's this some sort of action that's taking pl place that is affecting the dog's perception. Is that correct? Absolutely. And uh, Dogs, they don't speak in human words. I mean, they bark, but they, uh, and they understand um, some commands, but they're mostly reading their people's body language. And so even if it's something like, 
the the person who delivers the post um, or the mail is a is a black man of color, and uh, this dog witnesses their owner tense up around this person every time uh, they hear the door. They're going to start to decide, oh, this person uh, must be uh, have ill intent for some reason. Um, and so even when people are not are not explicitly trying to, and many people, and certainly many people don't consider themselves racist, um, but those those biases happen even in our subconscious, unless we are really, 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 and this is people as a whole, um, whether it's someone treating a woman poorly because just they have some misogynistic views um, or whether they have some transphobic views um, or some racist views, whatever those things are, they're coming out through, through our behavior, through the way that we move, through the way that we talk, through the way that we interact with the world. And we are, we as people are our dog's biggest signaler for how they should interact with the world. Um, so if somebody were coming to me and saying, my dog, oh, I think my dog is racist. Um, no, but you might have some things that you uh, need to examine within yourself. Um, and I think a lot of people might find when they're looking very deep down, there are some uh, there are some biased beliefs that pop up throughout their daily life, their daily interactions um, that their dogs are picking up on, even if they they weren't. Okay. Um, and so just to be clear then, are you saying that there's never a situation in which you feel a dog has looked at you and was prejudiced against you solely because of your complexion? Um, or like, where where's the line between racism and discrimination between distinguishing between different people? Well, it's interesting. Um, discrimination can happen to anything from anything. White people can be discriminated against. White people cannot experience racism because that's a specific institution. That's a specific um, idea designed around keeping and enslaving millions and millions of Black people throughout centuries and justifying that treatment. Um, the same as how during World War II, uh, people, uh, Japanese people, uh, were called Japs um, and were dehumanized specifically to justify the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Black people and people of color have been dehumanized for centuries through the institution of racism. Discrimination um, serves a function to just distinguish things on a basic, basic level, just distinguish two things from one another. Um, but to answer your question directly, I've never felt as a trainer and a behaviorist that a dog that I was working with has ever been afraid or concerned of me solely because of my complexion um, or my skin color. I have worked with many, many dogs who are afraid of either strangers or men, afraid of, I don't know, there's a whole host of things. But for me to assume um, that I am the problem with any dog that I'm working with, and not I'm the problem in a sense of I I held eye contact for too long, which is a big trigger, or I moved too quickly, um, or I'm already in their space, which is a very big grant on their part, um, if they are very wary of uh, new people coming into their house. Um, there's a whole list of things that I can that I can change in the way that I'm acting and the way that I'm interacting with this dog that will have an impact on how much that dog trusts me, how willing that dog is to work with me, how willing that dog is to just participate in um, whatever basic training we may be doing. But for me to assume that the issue is I am black 
that instantly ends the conversation with that dog just as it would with a person. Um, if the thing that I'm doing wrong at this dog is I'm existing as a black person, then that's, a, that's it. There's, li there's literally no more job that I can do there. Um, but I've worked with dogs in the shelter that have come from out of fighting rings. Um, unfortunately, a majority of those are run and participated in by black people, uh, extraordinarily poor black people. Um, but even those dogs in the shelters, after coming from fighting rings, um, have, after I approach them very gently, um, you know, not coming up to the first time, squared shoulders and staring them right in the eye, not giving them threatening language and just showing them like, look, I'm here to work with you. I know you have had a really bad time before, but I'm just here to show you not every person that you encounter is going to treat you terribly. In fact, here's a free treat. Now I'm going to walk away. And uh, I have worked with um, those fighting ring dogs, and I never once had an indication that their issue was my skin color. Um, there are many dogs who might take issue with that I am human. Um, and for those dogs, I'm truly sorry that uh, they had so many encounters with people of any um, gender or color or uh, way of being that reliably mistreated them. Um, but dogs, in interacting with me as an individual, I've never felt that they were that they were wary of me simply because I was I am a black man. So, and you've you've mentioned a couple. You mentioned um, you know. Uh, well, let me rephrase this question. Um, if it, if they're not if a dog if you are working with a fearful dog and you're going along the lines that they're not fearful of you because you're black that there's there's some other cause right what is the process of thinking what are the things you examine to establish what is actually the trigger of that dog's fear or concern well, first off, I am reading that level of fear and concern in their body language, um, where their feet are, where their torso is, um, where the eye, where the dogs look, um, because that's a major indicator, um, where they position their, themselves in space. Um, and so I usually run through a list of uh, many fearful or reactive dogs are particularly sensitive to prolonged eye contact um, with a person or another dog. And so it's also, that's a pretty easy thing to back check against. Um, if three times in a row, I, uh, even from the corner of my eye, hold that dog's gaze for a second or two seconds and they bark at me um, pretty loudly and pretty, um, pretty standoffishly and it's a pretty good indicator eye contact is a big trigger with for them um it could also be uh that i'm moving too quickly or i'm moving in a way that they don't that they haven't learned to predict the outcome of um like if i flap my hands around too fast um or if i go to reach into my pocket too fast to even to if it was to pull out a treat, if it's something, if um, it's any kind of action that they have learned means there's a negative consequence coming, um, that's something that they could very easily flinch away to or give me a growl, or uh, you might have a dog start to bear its teeth about those things. Um, so there's also just the factor of I am in their space at all, as I mentioned before. Uh, many dogs feel um, even when they're in their homes and there's totally nothing going on, a baseline level of anxiety that's much higher than zero um, and already take issue to strangers coming into their home for whatever reason. Um, it could be under socialization, could be they 
had a bad experience. Um, could be just they are, it happens so infrequently, they really don't know what to do with themselves. Um, and so where I am standing in that dog space, um, because I treat every, every dog that I'm going to see um, when I'm working in their home is this is, this is that dog's home. Like I am a guest in their home and they have very charitably decided to let me in. Um, but that can be pretty conditional. That can be conditional on I stand still as a statue in the corner and don't look at them and only mostly kind of talk out of the corner of my mouth um, and any questions that, uh, that their uh, parent is raising to me um, that I'm answering in as monotone a voice as possible. Um, I have met dogs who had all of those conditions um, to feel okay for me to stay. Um, can also be where and how I am interacting with their person in space. Um, a lot of dogs could feel protective over uh, their specific person or their, their family. And so that's also pretty easy to back check if I take a slight movement forward towards their person and the dog goes and positions um, itself between uh, me and its parent. That's a pretty good indicator of um, those dogs really of the opinion, no, no, you don't come near my people. I don't know you yet. Um, and that's just one of the things that dogs could do depending upon uh, where on the scale of assertive or passive um, they run. And I hesitate, I deliberately avoid using the language of dominant and submissive because there's already a lot of argument and already a lot of confusion around those words. Um, so to separate kind of from that language, um, the more assertive or the more passive uh, that a dog runs will be a key indicator in um, what they're taking issue with, whether that's to stand between me and the rest of their house, or if that's to retreat all the way into the far back corner and get as small as possible. Um, those are some of the things that I run through. Uh, mostly I'm looking at, uh, and the dog's body language is going to be the key indicator in all of it. Um, but those are all very reliable and easy things to back test against um, where they happen three times in a row is gonna be as many as you need to determine if that's a pattern or if that's a triggering type of um, event or action for that dog. Mm -hmm. um. So, oh, well, unfortunately, the stereotype that um, dogs are afraid of black people, um, and this is a stereotype that was even studied by Dr. Hawkins, so it was part of her study, um, is whether or not if a person who already has that stereotype will be able to, uh, if their perception is tainted, the outcome of their dog's behavior is, is tainted, because they hold that, that stereotype. Um, so because that stereotype is held, unfortunately, it's been kind of normalized. And I think that for whatever reason, owners are curiously, but also disrespectfully asking things like, is my dog racist? Or is my dog afraid of you because you're black? Or whatever. And so because that's been normalized, and because you probably have been asked that from a personal level, from a human level, how does it make you feel? What are the emotions you experience when a person asks you that? Um, well, for me on a personal level, um, because I have been asked that, and it doesn't tell me anything about the dog, but it does tell me a tremendous amount about their owner in that they have already decided that their dog doesn't like me, independent of anything that is actually happening in front of them. So these are people that have hired me and said things like, ah, he listens to you better than he listens to me, but then turned around 10 minutes later and asked, does my dog not like you because you're black? 
it didn't matter what I answer at that point um, because they've already decided, well, probably. A dog doesn't like other black people, which if somebody is willing to uh, blatantly ask that to my face after I have spent 15 minutes effectively communicating and succeeding um, with their dog and giving them treats and praise and teaching them five new commands um, in less time than they learned anything uh, command-wise from their person in three, five, 12 months, then it doesn't, it stopped mattering whatever my, whatever my thoughts were, whatever my opinion was, professional um, or otherwise, they stopped listening. They're not, they're not hearing it. Um, and so um, on a personal level, it makes me feel certainly very unsafe that I'm now, uh, that I'm in the home of a person who, for their part, has a pretty serious prejudice against me um, and probably carries a lot of other um, pretty dehumanizing biases. Um, and it also tells me that it doesn't, it also doesn't really matter what I accomplish with their dog. That if they're already willing to ask me that, um, even if I've spent a few minutes just warming up with their dog, um, getting to know their dog, building trust um, before handing them um, back over to be instructed by uh, their parents, that those people um, are, I can assume that their compliance or the things that they are supposed to work on after the session likely not going to happen. Um, just because they were said by uh, me, a person of color. Um, and I can also assume that whatever, um, whatever instructions I was giving them or whatever, uh, whatever information I had for them is going to be perceived as invalid. Um, and so it... Uh, I have to do a lot of very quick mental gymnastics and uh, emotional ceiling um, to decide this person has already indicated to me that they largely have decided I am invalid just for existing as a person of color. Um, and so it tends to take a pretty uh, pretty significant toll on the uh, the efficacy for the rest of the session um, it's hard to do my job when I perceive a threat to my person even if it was in the form of a shitty microaggression um, it's being being made to feel like I am less than for things that I cannot change hurts either way in whatever format it's coming. Um, is there anything that, you know, maybe there's an owner who, because of the recent state of things, is going through a self-reflection? Um, and, you know, maybe they live in a predominantly white neighborhood and they are not exposed to the realities of black communities, but also just in general, people of color and other ethnicities. And they're going through a process of self-reflection and they're realizing that they may hold some of these implicit biases and that inadvertently they have projected those biases onto their dog and maybe their dog hasn't had the socialization the exposure to things that they should have um what would you like them to know what would you like them to do um to better themselves and to better the health of their dog well i think uh first off um reading listening to podcasts youtube videos anywhere that they can find valid information, um, do that work to actively seek it out, but without making it the job of 
any individual black person that they may or may not know. Um, for someone willing to do this work, that's already a tremendous step. Um, but uh, there's a, I think there's a functional difference between seeking out readings, um, trying to find literature around uh, the history of systemic racism, um, and asking their one black friend, like, oh, what is this, like, tell me about, like, like being black, or like, tell me about how I'm supposed to, like, be a better ally, or um, what have you. So I think um, it starts from a place of uh, independently seeking out that information. I think the second thing that they can do is make a deliberate effort to vote with their wallet. Um, because where and how they spend their money is going to be ultimately probably the biggest impact that they're going